Okay, welcome ladies and gentlemen to the uh, second week of the e-assessment Scotland Transforming Assessment and Joint Online Conference. Uh, this particular session is looking at using narratives to assess free exploration in 3D spaces. The presenter today is Torsten Rienes from Curtin University. He is a senior lecturer in the School of Information Systems slash Curtin Business School and specialises in things like um, logistics and uh, has been doing a lot of work around um, authentic assessments and 3D virtual worlds and lots of exciting things that you will explain to us today. So I'd like to uh, hand over now to Torsten. Take it away. All right. Thank you, Matthew. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone. I just leave my camera on for probably like two minutes and then I just cut off the picture. I just thought it's interesting to have a view of me. Um, I'm from Curtin University and I'm currently working in a project, an OT grant, uh, where we explore um, the skill training in the context of logistics and supply chain management. So as Matthew correctly said, I'm mostly ham in the area of logistics and supply chain management, but with my background from IS and education, I drift most of the time a way to actually explore how we can help um, students, but also uh, in the transfer from the university to the companies, help students to understand different processes, different settings in a better and easier way. Um, the project um, is um, co-led by Lincoln Wood. I will um, introduce the team later when I actually talk about the project a little bit further. Um, the agenda is focusing assessment, but I thought that I have to do a quick, a uh, really quick introduction and the slides will not be long on. Uh, what's our motivation? Why we are really interested in uh, looking at um, virtual worlds for logistics supply chain management? What is the motivation for using game-based approaches? And then finally, the um, part about story and narrative and how we actually assess the process in the class. Or, or in the virtual world. So, small agenda. And, yeah, if you, Matthew pointed that out for, for, for basically for the uh, presentation, if you have any questions, um, just try to type it in the chat. I try to observe if something comes up. Um, it's a good idea to have all these little symbols, but um, it's easy to oversee them. So, at least the hand when you have a question gives me a bing. The other just don't do anything. So if I don't see it, uh, just try to actually put something in the chat and I will react to that. Uh, I'm welcome to have questions in between, so don't worry to ask and don't wait to the end. Um, but also our motivation. Um, motivation, especially in logistics supply chain management, is for us that it often requires a lot of tools, uh, machines, and um, organizing the machines in a larger context. All of that is really difficult to explain in a classroom or train and role play or doing in any other way. And that's a part of logistics that is mathematical oriented uh, theory, so that's easy in the classroom, but whenever we want to get practical experience, it's hardly impossible. Um, and that actually lacks of authenticity. Authenticity um, is what we take as encouragement to actually find a new way of teaching at a university um, using virtual worlds or other virtual environments. Uh, there are several training environments around, so there's a lot of simulators that actually allow to train on a vehicle, um, very well simulated vehicles, but most of these environments are lacking the process. So we are more interested how does a student does make this decision based on the surrounding or is actually um, executing these decisions. Not so much in the real 100% physical simulations itself. Um, what, we do, what we are normally doing is site visits. Um, this means that we organize a day where we went out to a company and students can actually look at warehouses, can look at the container terminal in the harbor, or we go in the, at the airport behind the scene. The problem with site visits are that they're hard to organize. Um, they require a lot of paperwork ahead. Um, 
could be about confidentiality. If we go to an airport or container terminal, it means that we have to fill out documents about background research, uh, background search, criminal activities. Um, it can exclude students from site visits based on the nationality. Um, a lot of container terminals have really strict restrictions on who is allowed on the terminal. So a lot of things that are hard to um, organize. On the other side, we have also a problem with safety. It's a dangerous environment. And if we go with larger groups, it's sometimes difficult to keep them together. Students are interested in have a look, make pictures, and all that can lead to severe accidents. So it's a great opportunity um, to actually meet staff, talk to staff, and get a real world impression and also get an impression of the size. Uh, standing next to a, a crane that is 30 meter high or even going up this crane, it's much better than actually just seeing a photo of it. Unfortunately, there are a lot of issues. Um, first of all, online students can't come with us. Um, it's dangerous. You run into accidents, and these accidents are everywhere if you go on a uh, site, a logistics site or a supply chain site. And so, um, it's, and the other problem is that it's definitely not easy to capture a bigger picture. You see maybe a warehouse, one part of a warehouse, you can understand the process that is involved in filling one box with material from one uh, shelf, but how the whole process of work is hard to see. Um, so, that was the motivation for our project, and we applied um, for a grant. The project is called Endive. Uh, Lincoln and uh, myself are in lead. Vanessa Chang um, from Curtin University. Christian Gutel is from Austria. He is at the University of Graz. Uh, Jen Harrington is Murdoch and Hannah Teres. Started uh, from Tank University in Finland, but uh, moved to the University of Wollongong here in Australia. So now we got from a rather international team uh, to a more local Australian team. Well, actually, Lincoln went to New Zealand last year. Um, the grant is, oh, after it's just a comment, so no question yet. Thanks, Matthew, for clearing that up for the international one yet. And, and actually was promoted to a major research grant. So it's uh, quite a good dimension for that. Endive, Endive for N dimensional immersive virtual environment. Uh, with the N dimension, we want to accentuate that it's not only the 3D space, but that we try to integrate other dimensions, uh, which can be the fun part, gamification. Um, we can integrate um, uh, the different stages at a supply chain, so we can look at one part or um, maybe just a warehouse, or we consider the whole supply chain from mining, and we'll have a picture about that, mining and all the processes that are lead to a final product for the consumer, and maybe even the return supply chain where we come from a product back uh, to the factory, maybe after its life cycle is over, or some repairs to be done. Um, we want to increase the authenticity through inclusion of real life complexity, so actually smashing complexity down that it's handled by, uh, it's possible to handle by a student. We use scenarios um, uh, linked into a comprehensive supply chain, squeeze that um, supply chain down so it actually fits onto a screen or into a virtual world, and including gaming mechanism for the fun part. Um, so skill training supply chain management. If you look at the bottom picture, I'm not sure if that works, so there is where the stars. There is a supply chain supplier, producer, retailer. They normally are located around the globe. And they're also taking a long time. So just the traveling by ship can take over a month from one side to the other side of the earth, and um, by that from one part of supply chain to the other part. So we can't actually follow the whole supply chain in a classroom, so time would be one issue. On the right side, you see that we can also dislocate the um, different parts in, for example, Second Life was a virtual island, um, and where we um, have one supplier, one producer, or retailer on each island, and therefore shorter times. Um, so um, that is just basically the idea where we went why virtual worlds, time and location 
squeeze me that further down. Um, the whole idea of the project in the beginning was that we will have training units. So you kind of have a book and that is actually representing the supply chain in the different steps along the supply chain. Students can pick this book, open this book and have um, three-dimensional di uh, three settings uh, that they can go into an experiment. Um, we started with Second Life currently investigating Unity as an alternative. The main reason for this step is that in um, Second Life the uh, physics engines, um, the behavior of gravity and the weight of object is hardly to realize and we have some examples where we actually rely on that. So we are currently in the step of transferring most of it into Unity as an alternative to explore. Um, more important than the books and learning units that's everywhere, more important for us is that these learning units are connected. So if something happened in one book, it will be actually transferred uh, or the outcome will be uh, um, uh, um, transferred to the next unit. So one example is a supplier um, produces a part, it will be in the transport unit visible, transported later to the manufacturing or sales unit and you will be able to follow um, a certain product or a certain material. Uh, this is important, especially if we want to simulate um, damages. So if you damage something as a supplier, some worker hits a box by accident, the box is okay, but the content took a damage. Um, that part should go all the way through and maybe in the manufacturing part, that part will cause a damage in the machine. That is something that you can't practice in real life and normal simulation tool do not allow actually the backtracking to a sense uh, to in a way that a student can learn from it. Uh, learning unit would be here if whenever you have a damage report it, make sure that it didn't cause any side effects that later involve problems. Um, so one part of our simulation is that we actually can rewind or give an explanation about how something was caused. Different perspectives is another aspect of our n-dimensionality. Um, in the top part of this slide you see um, different perspectives, like one more in a controller observing the whole supply chain, and this is a supply chain that we realized in Second Life on a container terminal. Um, second would be more an operation manager that observe um, it's one process via the computer. On the other side we have um, our three, the driver, that is um, doing the actual transport of, for example, a container. And four would be like developing new devices or verifying what, um, the technical um, specification of devices and um, how an um, exchange of parts can improve the um, capacity or the speed and over the uh, overall, uh, and there was the overall process. So different perspectives, connectivity between the different units. And another part that we want is a high immersion. Uh, we're currently looking in a far more immersion that Second Life normally provides. Um, um, I'll Matthew ask for the last slide. Um, unfortunately, um, that was part of a development that I did before I came here, the container terminal, and actually the motivation for the proposal and demonstration in the proposal that we can achieve that. Um, the, uh, our goals and that part was in University of Hamburg and when I left um, they didn't maintain the funding and I had to reassemble that. It's currently in my inventory um, so not really open to the public. I intend to recreate it as soon as there's time which is not often the case unfortunately. Um, I have some videos, if someone wants I can probably make access, uh, give access to the videos showing a little more details about that part. Uh, so yeah, we want to um, go for um, a higher immersion, so especially, if, um, I'll try to spin it from the other side. Our, our goal is um, on one side the processes, on the other side we are really interested in having side visits that are safe and um, people get um, in one piece from the side. Uh, that one scenario could mean that uh, students 
um, gain kind of awareness what kind of problems are existence on a, de uh, a site and warehouse or container terminal, what can happen to someone. So we want to get um, the uh, perspective from a person being on this environment. The monitor is quite limited um, as you don't feel 100% immersed in the environment. We're currently experimenting with the Oculus Rift. We have a development kit and we've discovered that with a headset where you get the 3D um, projected and actually your head navigation is um, immediately recognized and changing the, um, the view is a uh, much closer feeling and especially danger situation are taken serious. So if I walk below a container in Second Life, students or staff didn't feel really in danger because they saw themselves as an avatar. If we do the same scenario with head-mounted displays, we actually experienced that they were careful and cautious when they walked under this container. So there's a higher sensitivity about the environment. We want to um, achieve that. Other things, various um, facilitation of collaboration, so working together, exploring the space together, more discussions, all typical things for virtual world, so I don't have to really talk about that too much. Uh, the other part was the fun. We really want to get over with um, um, boring environments where you're alone, but we want to engage students. So um, we picked up gamification or game-based training within this part. Um, I don't want to say that virtual worlds are not fun, but um, we all know that a learning environment can be boring if everyone is gone, or that most of these parts are quite serious. Um, you probably have heard about gamification, you're probably completely aware about it, so I just give like a really brief introduction. So some games, and games, not gamification, more games, in logistics supply chain management, be a game uh, where you have, you, you become a brewer and you have to make sure that the customers are supplied with enough beer and as there's competition, make the most money. First Connection is basically the same, but more in the fruit market, people compete um, in different supply chains against each others and try to make the largest market share. Uh, same with the candy factory game. Uh, what you see is a screenshot fresh connection. These games are presented in that way. Good games, really perfect simulation of supply chains. Unfortunately, not much fun to work only with numbers. Um, and we target more the skills and training, and so we would look more for 3D. There are wonderful games. This is a game that was um, developed in Germany and um, is available as a game, not even, uh, not even education. It's a simulation of the whole harbor in Hamburg in real time. There is unfortunately no speed up as we couldn't find one. And you have to do so many tasks that it actually, it turns out to be more number checking and waiting, waiting that a ship goes from A to B which can 15 minutes before it arrives. Um, kind of like Slim City. Um, Slim City was uh, more activity can do. Here um, we stopped playing it after a few hours because we were only waiting. Um, it was good because we could read something next to that, but it's not really an engaging and fun part. Slim City has more activity. You always have to do something and uh, therefore more interesting. Some Second Life examples, um, there's a fuel cell that was developed in Hamburg, there is a mass simulation, not sure where it's right now, and the other one top is not actually, uh, it's really, I don't think it's Second Life, but it's um, an, an, a lot of experiments or simulation um, are done in, um, in medicine. Um, the one medicine has a high authenticity, could be improved by further devices, but the problem is normally that you um, try to train real problems but um, and to achieve real skills. Um, driving a car simulator, I wouldn't suggest that they can immediately go on the street and deal with the real traffic. The same applies if you train real problems in a logistics scenario. You most likely can't go to a real environment like the harbor simulator. Um, the complex communication, judgment, expert thinking, and um, advanced problem-solving skills are mostly not addressed in this software. 
they need someone, a trainer, a lecturer at um, besides it that goes through the results and explains what is um, what has to be done, what has to be improved, and where the problems are. I'm not generally saying that it's every um, game in uh, logistics supply chain managers that have these pro problems, but most of them are quite limited. Um, if we get a higher authenticity, and that's a f the fresh food connection, they should get um, handled, for example, warehouse problems with workers and how well they're trained um, by seeing it by numbers. And this is a very low authenticity in our perspective. Um, so opportunity to exercise realistic work practices, cognitive processes that are aligned with the authentic situation um, while actually performing them. Uh, to get a valuable feedback and not something like just the task was done or was not achieved, more in a reasoning what is missing and what could be improved. And especially the improvement formative feedback would be helpful. Um, okay, and we need authentic sources and materials for that. Um, in logistics or in uh, different navigational um, in, uh, areas, there are Simulators, on the bottom left, there's a ship simulator where you get an authentic uh, bridge from a vessel and you can drive in different harbors or waterways and get an impression of how a ship behaves. And you can simulate dangerous situations so you can actually put the uh, student in a uh, stress situation. On the right is one example that I kind of mentioned in the beginning, there are simulation how forklift works. This is, I think, done by the producer of the forklifter uh, to demonstrate how the operation of this forklift is done. Uh, flight simulators, either on a computer without the motion, or then you have the capsule where you actually uh, feel the motion as well. Uh, fidelity is another aspect we looked into. Um, how much do we have to invest in money, developing time, to make it uh, look real, behave real, or is there a certain margin where we can stop putting more money in and maybe have less uh, realistic textures or ignore some parts of the environment and it's, not, it's still accepted by the students. Uh, we found so far out that um, medium fidelity and without any scale on that, is working at a certain point, you're investing more in the look than actually in the learning outcome. Still, I think that is something that is well known with you. Gamification, putting game mechanisms into the game. Uh, the best definition, I think, is by SAP. Gamification is for fun, play, and passion. So making work more fun. To do that, there are different ways that you find in everyday life or in special websites. Uh, one arc by Shafar, for example, is that you get a stat, how many books you have read overall, and if you keep that current, then this book number would represent the real number. And more important is, like where my star is right now, that you are ranked at a certain position for editing, contributing to this website, and I'm 33 added away for getting, uh, no, one more um, added away uh, from position 9036, so it's almost a jump of 200 position up the rank uh, ladder, and that should encourage me to actually do more work in it. Again, something that is also relevant to time. Uh, gamification can have a weird um, outcome. One is that uh, you get points for everything, and you don't actually, you don't focus anymore on your work, but only trying to get points. Kind of a counter side of the good idea of gamifying a process. What you want to do is like um, find a good way between skills and challenges. So your game or your design of your environment should be challenging in a way that it matches your skill. If it's too hard to achieve some points, you probably get anxiety. Um, on the other side, if you are over have a lot of skills and the tasks are quite easy, you will be bored. So the best one is going on the diagonal, as in most cases. Um, gamification, we um, kind of took the existing one and want to add to that. Um, 
I put this slide in to have it for you ready if you need it for later reference. Basically, it's gamification is about to provide an intention, objective targets, design some dynamics, and there's where we are uh, with the storyline and the narratives. So our, what is driving the whole gamification system to actually achieve the target? In the later, in the second, uh, next level, you have mechanics. You build achievement challenges that someone using the system has to do. That could be for you work with Excel that your line manager gives you a task that is using or has to use a, a skill that you not yet have, but that you can look up by books or materials that he provides. So the challenge is to solve this task by using that meant material. And then there are components that actually are used to show progress or uh, or realize these challenges in a more physical way. Uh, and then uh, components is like also the score that you get at the end of the game or your leaderboard where it shows in which position you are. Again, don't want to talk too much about gamification, but I want to call, focus on these dynamics and especially the storyboard and the line and the narratives in the context of what I said before with the project, with the logistics, and, and, and um, looking into realizing the skill and training center. Dynamics um, often includes that you have a game master. Some of you might remember Dungeon Master, where you, uh, the dun uh, dun uh, Dungeon and Dragons, where you had the Dungeon Master who was telling the story with all side quests, but at some certain points the player um, had an opportunity to decide or roll the dice to trigger some actions. So the Dungeon Master or the Game Master is quite important. On the other side, if the intention is also to take the player or the person in this process, kind of as a puppet and kind of guide it to certain uh, parts. Our intention is more to cut all the lines loose and have a free, free exploration of the space rather than focusing on the specific task that has to be done and you get the um, credits in form of scores. We're not cutting or we don't plan to cut all of these lines that control the user or the player, but we want to keep one, probably one that you tie around the waist and what that we can pull in case something goes wrong, kind of security line to keep them in a certain range or curtain context. Uh, otherwise, we want to have a free explorer. And we want to have possibilities for this player and that goes then also along with the assessment. Uh, at certain points when we assess a player, we want to give an option that learned by, um, based on the formative feedback that the player can do actions like rewind. From one point, I get the information, I did something wrong, I will not be possible to achieve the outcome that I should do. I can rewind to a certain point in the past. Same with save points. I can say, okay, from here to um, the next five minutes, I only did the correct task. I'm proud of that. I want to keep it. But after this five minutes, I want to experiment with other scenarios or other ways of doing things. So I can always go back to the safe point. Um, in this list, one thing that are in learning not so much part, uh, done and no, I even thought not often encouraged, we want to have actual, uh, we want to have play, um, player or students to experience a, a dead end. And in our case, as we want to train skill and training, uh, skills and um, safety, we want to also that they can um, get into an accident and have uh, and die, because that is something that we want to prevent at the end. But if you don't know all the possibilities, how you can actually die, what is dangerous or can it get injured, uh, you will not watch out for that in the real life. So showing the danger and actually and have them experience this danger is one a part of our simulation. So there is a game over and we can have something like a certain number of lives. So they are careful. In a lot of games there are numbers of lives, unlimited numbers, and you never be careful because you can go over and over and over, but sometimes it might be good 
um, to have a limit. Uh, the other parts, um, slow motion would be good for showing processes that are fast. Machines work with an output of um, thousands per, um, per minute. So cutting that down and seeing how one unit is pro um, produced would be one interesting part. Stories. Stories we see as the information and the experience that are passed from the storyteller to the audience. Stories have the good thing that a storyteller, a good storyteller can engage in, uh, uh, the audience and can motivate um, kind of pictures coming from inside based on the experience that um, our um, person had. So they're already built into the knowledge from the past. The disadvantage if you tell stories, you sit around the fire, for example, and you do not experience it yourself by doing it. So you uh, motorial, um, um, motor skills, like the movement skills, are not really trained. Um, stories have narrated, which is a unique path through the story that unliven or unfold in space, uh, the story in the space, and tries to help the understanding of the um, story and build the cognitive structures. Obviously, if we have a book, we have one story that we read from uh, the first page to the last page. In other scenarios, we can have different narrators in the same story. If I tell you you should um, do a certain process like go shopping, your narrative through the supermarket, or starting at home, making the shopping list, going to the store, going through the supermarket and picking up objects, and the way of paying will be different to the other person. So each of us has a different narrative. On the other side, if we have a defined shopping list in the beginning, we want to end up with the same basket at the end, independent of the process. We can still compare the narratives. So time could be one issue. Uh, it took me two hours, you three hours. I kind of did a better job in managing the shopping process. Cost could be put in relation. If I took uh, two hours but invested a high amount of money to get a taxi while you were going with a bike, you might be um, balancing it differently and you win with the bank as a better one. Um, and obviously, not only narrative, we also need a uh, larger structure kind of chapters that goes through our story. So we have a long story throughout the class. Uh, narratives are shown on the side. There's one narrative for the teacher. And certain challenges that a student can pick so based on the first chapter, there might be units that a student don't want or want in a different way. They choose different narratives on the way. And that could be a more mathematical for, uh, orientation or if they don't know the background of certain parts, they go in a special unit to learn about that. Not so much um, how to explain that complete process, but I want to focus on the warehouse. Uh, a map nowadays. Good books have a map to explain where locations are. So if you get lost about the location, you look at the map and you understand how the actors or the uh, um, characters move from A to B. Uh, so on the right side, you see the raw materials, processing, warehouse, and then the city where the customer is. Uh, and people can follow the supply chain uh, steps by this. And we have the narrative, and I'm diving in to one part uh, that was shown on the last slide and read the warehouse. And we kind of have a teacher that has a narrative. The teacher is the expert that knows how to get, um, how to solve a task designed by an instructional designer. And in most cases, the expert will go a more or less direct route, uh, not doing extra tasks, don't wasting time, don't wasting material, and successfully. Um, coming to an end, fulfilling the objective. Uh, the learner on the other side can go in various ways, uh, either direct, which means they know about it and they learn the material, or they do detours. Detours could be that they have to look up certain things, that they, if they drive in the warehouse, that they take the wrong aisle and end up not by the product, by a different area and have to go backwards, wasting time, or there could be challenges if they uh, load the um, goods on a pallet. They might not consider um, the dimension and can't go through a door or can't load it in the car. 
And that challenge has to be solved by either redoing it or by finding a different car, for example, where it can fit. Um, transferring this um, more abstract on a concrete example, we have a warehouse um, where we have the border, um, where, which is the part on the right side, two-thirds of the right side. Um, you, the only way out is um, a way actually I can go to the next slide. That is the warehouse, the same thing from a 3D perspective rather than the schematics. So you have the warehouse. Uh, you have three shelves with goods. You have a door through which you have to bring the order, which means one product, uh, to the UD that is waiting there with a customer. Uh, you see bigger vehicles outside. Um, they will drive, so you can see there is an activity. You know your context, your surrounding. Uh, you have different uh, forklifter on the side. Each forklifter has different specification. Here it's a weight limit that um, um, has um, what a ute is. The ute is this little car there. It's, I think it's is it an Australian term. I never thought about. It's a truck with a loading area in the back. As far as I know, I hope I'm right. Um, forklifters have a weight specification, so some can carry a ton, some can only carry half a ton, and that is important. Uh, to rec notice when you pick up a box and the box is too heavy, the uh, forklifter will flip over. And there's on the right side a computer where you can look up information from the um, from the order, like which shelf the product is in. So an expert would start at this location, go to number one, look up the last order or the latest order, will go to one of the forklifter that matches the uh, weight of the order, in this case one ton, drives to the right shelf position, uh, goes, uh, drives out and goes to the customer knowing from the computer terminal where he has to bring it, in this case driving it to the bring it to the utility vehicle, the ute. Um, different challenges are that um, you have to recognize where somebody is currently. We limit this to triggers because we are not so much interested in the way around, as you will see in the next slide when the student is doing it, but we are interested in certain areas. So the T1, trigger 1, triggers act, um, the arrival of someone between the shelves. Um, decision making. Uh, I will explain in a second. That's an important point. The decision making is done by uh, drastic measurements. Um, also, the other thing is driving outside will be recognized so we know it's either in or out of the warehouse. Um, to answer that question, decision making, um, we go back further to how a student would solve this task. It's kind of complicated, like this games where you have to find the exit of a maze. Um, the student starts again here. But rather than going straight to the computer to check out the order, and you can assume a student that never went to a warehouse but just read the book, or even a student that knows about the warehouse but is not aware that that's the first task in this case. So he runs around, he looks at the forklifter, he goes to the shelf randomly and maybe meets a coworker, have a little chat with it, uh, with a coworker, and we use bots for this, and the bot will be the simple very simple chatbots, just having a limit to, um, I don't want to talk to you about, <laughs> but you should consider working as there are some orders waiting. Uh, this, in this case, the student went out um, out to the ute, saw the gap, and saw the actions of walking there. And this will be triggered, and that is where we have the, the virtual um, string attached to the student. As in that case, when we have this trigger, the driver will come and intercept the student and ask about the order, so the student gets another reminder that there was actually something to be done. If they don't get stopped by the driver, we actually intend to have, um, we have this um, water where they can fall and drown, we have vehicles that they can run into, and there will be a fence around that they actually stop, so they will have no way to go. In this case, the student went back, and I have to follow my line by myself. It goes to the computer, knowing from the driver there's an order. I'm reading the order, and goes to the forklifter, picks the one up that can only weigh half a ton, goes into the aisle. Oh, no, actually, yeah, sorry. It go, and the student goes right, drives in the wrong aisle, so probably forgot to check either the shelf numbering 
or checking where the order is, uh, finds out the wrong shelf has to go back to the other area. As we have trigger there, we are able to recognize that something was wrong and we can give a form, uh, feedback right away if required. We tend currently to not give a feedback right away, uh, but have the student discover the errors by itself and give a final feedback, which includes all these messages. Coming to this aisle, that is where the student finds out that the wrong decision was made. Uh, so the student will pick up the um, product by the forklifter and the forklifter flip over and will first of all damage the forklifter and probably injures the student. So the student will know that something was wrong and the feedback would be that based on the flipping over there must be something wrong with the order weight and the capacity uh, or specification of the forklifter. Recognizing that the student goes back and realizes there are actually three different kinds of forklifter and what you couldn't see in the picture is the label that is big on the side showing that. And then picks up the order and actually brings it out. So we have two narrators, one of the teacher and one of the learner. And what we do, we just basically compare the milestones, the triggers in between. So on this slide, you see the narrator from the teacher on the top with the triggers 0 to 4 that were um, done. And on the other side, you see the eight triggers events that happened with the student. And basically, we try to match events. So in this case, event one, which uh, was walking to the computer, um, and two, in, the, in this order, is walking, being at the computer, are matched with each other. We can then compare the subsequences and while the expert walked quite quickly to the computer, taking maybe only two minutes, one minute, um, the learner had a long time between zero and one, between um, the event zero and one, um, which was a free exploration, just running around in the warehouse. We don't care where the time comes from, but we can tell the student that first, he spent too much time in that stage, and on the other side, he actually spent um, too much uh, walking distance, dis just distance during that time. So two errors that were done and where the student can improve. If it would be just time and no walking, we could conclude that he was doing something else. One possibility was looking up information, what I have to do, checking textbooks. So the first run, that would be a long time, but still it can be improved. And if he redoes, is redoing the scenario, that would be done by then. Guidance, we know that the U driver was talking, so bots were involved, and they gave hints, so we know that there's a stage of guidance. The next part, getting the order, is quite quick for the, or it's just one step for the expert, but it actually involves one, two, three, four steps from two to six uh, for the student. Naive, it's a naive decision making, and we come, that's where the process is. We know that we expect a decision process picking the right forklifter. It was a wrong one. It was the very first one to pick. Uh, so we know it was a naive decision-making process. It was uh, not based on the information we provided. And with the right design that it's not the first or the last one, we can kind of trigger um, the difference between a naive and a um, guided or based on information uh, decision. Uh, after that, there's a lot of driving. Again, wrong driving in the wrong direction. So there's a time and distance. He get, uh, the student got, again, guidance by knowing that there was not in the right aisle. And an understanding process after we gave the hint that the student went to the correct aisle. And after that, um, the two... Uh, oh, wait, sorry. So sorry, guidance. Five. At five, the, um, the guidance was by the forklifter crashed and caused an accident. So basically, the student understood that the right forklifter has to be picked. So if the next trigger is the forklifter, we know that there is an understanding process. This is quite simplified, but um, our first um, experiment, and that's by far a work in, work in progress, uh, shows that we, can, we are able, to a certain extent, to match the event and learn from different behaviors that we record. Uh, learn um, how or what can be 
what was done or what caused certain actions in the virtual environment. So we learned from the narrative order in which certain tasks were done. And we learn about time and how fast or how slow uh, tasks can be done and where the problems are. Um, the marks are associated um, by using the gamification concept. We will have later um, uh, a feedback that involves time, involves um, cost, distance, number of communication that were necessary, numbers of times that the system was left, um, left in a sense, um, not the focus on the software. We can only recognize that if it's really the software in another screen. Um, like put stuff looking up. And uh, the game approach comes that you get encouraged by different feedback, like sector times, um, uh, feedback about how you used a certain device. So the forklift or driving was, uh, is possible to be done with um, driving 900 meters and you had to use 960. So the encouragement comes, which is done by the games all the time, that you want to have the last meters. Um, with social gaming, there's always these stars. So you get like three stars when you did the perfect or two and one stars if you didn't. So we can encourage the same way of giving stars, we probably would go not for three stars, but stars in different categories and you have to optimize everything. And only if you get in all categories perfect scores, you will have all categories. Uh, you will be considered as an expert that knows how to operate this scenario. With changing settings, you balance out that they don't memorize how to do it exactly. Um, um, established analysis process and game design. It's part of that in game design, so it's not 100% from us. Um, they normally don't go down to the feedback so much, so the feedback part will be where we uh, spend more time on. Um, I try to go through the gaming literature. I'm not really coming from the game literature. Um, I talked to some people in Hamburg from game companies. They, because we looked we're looking for something that is doing the matching already. And I have a PhD student that works in a similar part. And uh, they said that it's not necessarily done to that details and especially not with the intention of getting the, the what happened in the part. So knowing that's a naive decision, it was an exploration part, a guidance part. And forming, building by that formative feedback. Um, doing the virtual world and transferring this world to the learning. Uh, definitely. So that is um, what we are um, looking for. So the, from the timeline, uh, we currently have, uh, this, uh, we're currently implementing the system. And our, our deadline based on the project proposal is in end of November that we have finalized. We tried several experiments in Second Life and recorded everything by hand and did match um, did match the uh, events by hand uh, just to develop the algorithm and develop the um, difficulties and we got um, as I'm coming from algorithm development and uh, machine learning from my computer science side uh, we have a good feeling how that works and how we have to develop that and so we are currently implementing this um, alignment and um, feedback part have just in time learning black like students can access information about something like the choice around how to lift a certain weight with forward lift. Um, just in like can, can access more about. Um, there will be, so the computer is one part. We will um, provide the students with um, kind of like a telephone option so they can click on it and ask different questions, either predefined questions or if we have it in an observed training environment that they can talk to someone like, I'm totally lost. Uh, we, this is the easiest scenario. So with um, uh, this part, no, wait, hold on, I'm switching back. In this scenario, we have this forklift at three times. If you go for larger scenarios in later lectures, you will have um, different vehicles. So on a container terminal, you can have the vehicles grabbed from the top. You have all vehicles that you have to load it on. You have automi um, automatically driving 
uh, vehicles dry, um, driven by a driver. So all that can be put into the scenario later. From from the beginning, we are um, limiting ourselves to kind of scenarios where you have a choice between the options, uh, but very restricted. So three or two choices. Uh, here are choices again with the shelf aisle and the object to find. Um, here we only have pallets, probably with the oh no, there are actually barrels in it. So bar barrels, you should have um, uh, a different vehicle, so these vehicles wouldn't even work. So basically, a decision could be: you're getting this order, he has to decide to decline it, as he can't do it. Would be a possible option that we didn't think of yet. We always took the pallet. Um, Authentic student, uh, so our assessment tries to do an authentic learning. We focus on the student and make the student to think and try to solve the problem. We put them in the scenario without any hint what would they expect, uh, something that we would expect in a real world scenario after some introduction. So there will be a class, they will know the scenario for some extent, but we wouldn't give a hint for the order or which vehicle to use as this would be something they have to do in real life as well. So you can't go to your boss all the time and ask him that order, which vehicle, and so on. Um, and using certain knowledge and skills from the past. So relevant, not oversimplified. We can't do it really in 2D because with 2D, certain scenarios wouldn't even happen uh, or wouldn't be visible for the student. Um, clearance. Driving around a corner, we want the student to be in the perspective of the vehicle uh, and not from on top because there are certain rules how to drive safely in a warehouse. There are people running around, other vehicles driving. Um, there is um, putting, um, um, lifting the forklifter and uh, making sure that you have the weight balance on the um, forklifter is something you have to train and you can't do really in 2D. So 3D is in part where we can't oversimplify too much. Um, different perspective, collaboration, we want to have multiple students that can work as a team. Integrating learning with the assessment, um, so that is a formative feedback at certain steps that you can um, turn on and off. And the slide just changed, I'm not sure why that happened. Um, um, artifact alternative paste, oh, so we don't if students can think of other alternatives, we also not only look on the past, we also look on to, um, we also look if the final result was achieved, and then we can go backwards and um, give a feedback on that. So if you get the container to the ute, in Second Life, it's sometimes just running again to the shelf because the object fell down and rolled over. We can look back and see forklifter was used. Yes, it is a requirement. Yes, it's a requirement because it um, good weighs 700 kilograms. You don't, can't do that without a vehicle. So things like that actually can be done. If they find a different way that is possible, yes, we would uh, consider that and the learning process and including in the potential solution. Um, so for the project, we, we want that fun comes back. That's why we want to use the technology as the Oculus Rift, as head-mounted devices. We want to make it encouraging with the sounds and, um, and the feeling to be there. So authenticity, immersion is important. We want that to retain the knowledge and don't lose it again. I think there's an automatic time in it. Or maybe it's the indication that I should stop. Um, um, uh, virtual worlds, you know, prominence and authenticity, unrestricted availability and interactivity, gamification, again, for the fun. And what's most important uh, for us is um, that you get an awesome environment that you want to go to for, and that's important, self-explorative learning, and you can succeed or you can fail. And the failure is, for us, the preferred uh, part because we want to encourage to get perfect and not just the 50% to pass. We want that the students get 100% right and survives without any injuries. In a normal exam in a classroom, they would learn about the process. They will write an exam. They will get something correct and they will get 50% and pass. This 50% loss can actually be that the forklift there smashed a person. Um, everything else was correct, so they pass but kill people, and we don't want that. In some environments, it's more important to be 100%. And if someone is from 
medicine there, then probably you don't want to have a surgeon that barely pass an exam, but you want to have student, uh, uh, surgeons that are in the top percentile and you can trust them that they know what they do, especially if situations don't run perfectly smooth. Um, that, that's it. So, um, what's the question in between? I took an hour, which is not too bad. Uh, almost on time, Matthew. Thanks, Torsten. That was wonderful. Um, if anybody has questions, they can type into the text box, or if you'd like, we can um, hand over the microphone as well. Um, whilst you're thinking of some questions, if you could please click the link that's currently on the screen to the feedback survey, that would be wonderful if you could fill that in. Um, but as I mentioned, please continue with the question and answering. Oh, and, uh, and you can obviously, somewhere there's probably an email address, um, you can uh, follow that up um, by sending me an email and uh, besides the work that we try to program, we will work pretty soon on our web presentation and dissemination a little bit better, fall behind um, uh, uh, all the other tasks. Uh, but I can keep you updated and um, invite you for the experiments that we start in November as planned. Um, with, um, I think Leah, it was you being in curtain. Yeah, we can definitely meet and I can show you a little bit more. Um, uh, it's easier. Uh, the environment will be Unity, so um, te technically it's possible to use that on any device, any computer, with any operating system, in theory at least. Uh, you won't have the Oculus Rift with that coming, but we make it also possible for students to just have it as a game to play. Um, definitely invited for that. And send questions by mail. And thanks for that. Um, Torsten, I've pasted your email address into the text chat there. People can see ah. t.runes at cbs.curtain.edu.au if you'd like to follow yeah. up by email. Yes. And I put the website um, for the project. Again, we're currently starting to actually set it up. And it might not have all the information like um, publications so on it yet. Uh, and not many postings, but that will continue as we now have the research time before was reading time and learning time and experimenting time. Okay, once again, thank you, Torsten. Um, I'll probably stop the recording now, and if people want to stick around, that's fine. Um, yep. If not, thank you very much for your efforts. Thank you. Very much yep. appreciated. Sure. No, no worries. Uh, I enjoy doing it, actually. <laughs>